Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutforth and special guest, the fifth Sci Guy, Noah Finns. Hey! Yeah! <laughs> This week we're talking about the maker of maternal magnetism and the father of phallic fascination. But first, we have a YouTube comment. Hooray! This one says, this episode is so all over the place, but kind of in a good way. That's from auditory processing disorders, that makes sense, and this one's likely going to be very much the same. My question for you all, if you're watching or listening, get down to the YouTube comments. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else, go to YouTube, get to the comments, answer this. The question is, are you mentally ill? <laughs> Uh, a really? bit of a personal question, Corey. Really, still in my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that. What, be, be mentally no, ill? No, I say, anyone here have a mental illness? On stage. Yeah. Okay, I see. I'm sorry for stealing your thunder. Yeah. So, we're talking about Freud today, if you, if you weren't aware. So, shall we talk a little bit about his early life? Yes. I know him. Yeah, tell Not me about personally. it. Where was he born? Uh, Austria. That's good. What town? Uh, Jesus, I don't know any towns in Austria. <laughs> Freiburg. Um, it's now in the Czech Republic, though. Uh, <laughs> that was on the May 6th in 1856. When he was four, he moved to Vienna, uh, where he basically lived and worked for his entire life. His dad was Jakob, or Jacob, I think Jakob, probably. Jakob. Uh, <laughs> So Jacob was Jewish. Uh, he was a wool merchant, and it's um, it's important that I uh, mentioned he's Jewish for a reason. Okay, every oh, single no. look, every I feel like every Sorry, single what year time was this? he was born in 1856. Well, you just said you're mentioning he's Jewish for a reason, and I thought, oh no, the war. The How war. close are we to the war? Close enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> look, every single like I feel like it feels really odd to mention, and they were Jewish whenever I'm talking about someone and on the podcast. They were roommates. But like, yeah, but look, every single time I say it, it's always for, a, it's the same reason, yes. to be yeah. fair. I just feel like I need to call it out so people aren't listening and being like, why, why is that an important, why do you feel that's the most important detail to bring up? Yeah. There's many other interesting things. Like maybe, maybe he liked jazz. Yeah, but there wasn't a time where they like rounded up all the jazz likers. Did they round up people who thought that uh, little boys wanted to have sex with their moms? What? Is that not his whole thing, Freud? Yeah. Freud. Yes. But they would, there was only one of them. There was one... <laughs> there was one guy. There was one that was it. No one else believed him. To, well, there was one little boy who wanted to have sex with their moms and he projected his insecurity onto the entire world. <laughs> to be fair, there are two. If you count Oedipus... Oh, I don't think he's he's real. No, but, he's not real. Oh, prove it. Prove it. Anyway, <laughs> shall we move on? So, uh, when uh, Freud was born, his dad was 40 years old, um, and it says that he was like kind of like, and again, this is all important stuff, because if you know Freud, like his dad was distant, and he was authoritarian, apparently. And his mum was hot. And he was 40, so he, you know, he hadn't uh, aged a lot and was probably sexually attractive. Or a good N foe that you wish to overcome. He, he was 40 in 1856. Man, man oh, probably he was, was old back then, right? Yeah, probably, well, not that old, but wow. like probably not looking great. Anyway, no, his mum was, uh, it, it, and I'm using like an exact quote here, more nurturant and emotionally available, because that's what I want in my mother's. <laughs> emotionally <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I feel, I feel that makes sense. Not true. Yeah, no, that would, that would be nice. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> so uh, Freud also had two older half brothers, um, and he had a nephew as well who was one year older than him. Um, who was basically like it, it says here the model of intimate friend and hated rival that Freud off <laughs> that reproduced often at later stages of his life. So basically, wow. um, this was his, uh, this was like his closest friend, but also like a rival, kind of like. I was going to say Gary Oak from Pokemon, but that's a reference that's lost on both of you. Anyway, um, and then he would have more relationship like, relationships like that throughout his life. Um, and then they moved to uh, Leipzig in 1859 and then to Vienna a year after that. I think I mentioned that. Yeah, so Freud stayed there until um, the Nazis came along um, and annexed Vienna 78 years later. So he was there like basically his entire oh, life. Oh, God, he was old. He was old. Wow. Yeah, he was very old. And in 1866, he married Martha Bernays, who was uh, the daughter... No. No. The creator of Bernays sauce. No, and B A R N A Y S. Um, <laughs> she was just, she was from like a very sort of uh, I guess influential uh, Jewish family. Um, yeah, from her sauce. <laughs> they had they had six kids. Um, Anna Freud was one of them. She 
was a psychoanalyst herself, apparently. Wow. Yeah, and like father and like daughter, apparently. But uh, clearly Ooh. no one knows Anna Freud's... Um, stuff she like, wasn't that relevant though, like, was she? i mean i feel kind of bad like you know you're living in someone's shadow like as soon as your dad comes up with everyone wants to have sex with their mom not just me <laughs> and also everyone is obsessed with penises and it's not just me if that's your dad i feel like that kind of like mm, puts a damper on anything you're gonna do for the rest <laughs> of your career um and <laughs> so like sort of moving on, um, he got married, and a little bit after he was married, um, apparently was when he met one of his best friends, um, Wilhelm Fleece. Fleece. I should have done that better. How do you, how do you spell that? Wilhelm Fleece. Um, F R L I E S S. Fleece. 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 It's Fleece. Fleece. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We're moving on. So um, he helped sort of like, you know, um, develop psych- uh, psychoanalysis, um, apparently. Um, and, you know, <laughs> literally, like, I love the way this is this is described. It says, throughout the 15 years of their intimacy, Fleece provided Freud an invaluable interlocutor for his, among- for his most daring ideas. Basically, he was chatting with the guy about all of his ideas. And this was his mate for 15 years. Freud would, like, you know, like, psychoanalyze people and he'd come back and chat to his mate. He'd be like, so I think everyone wants to have sex with mummy. <laughs> with think? mummy. With mummy? Don't you like your mummy too? You want to kiss mummy? <laughs> want to kiss her on the lips? Yeah, but which lips? Anyway, um, in 1933, wow. the Nazis burnt a lot of books. I mean, but specifically a lot of Freud's books. Um, and then in 1938, um, as, I, as I said, um, Nazis annexed Austria just a little bit before that. Freud left uh, Vienna and had to, headed to London and he was there with his wife and Anna, his daughter. Uh, but he had jaw cancer. He was diagnosed with that in 1923 which is insane, by the way. 1923, he was diagnosed with that um, and had like over 30 operations and then died on September 1939. So he had for 16 years jaw cancer. Jesus. I know, right? Anyway, so he, as I said, operations died in uh, 1939. So let's talk a little bit about his education. He, you know, he went to school. Boring. It's Spurl Gymnasium. Uh, do you know anything about that? No? A gymnasium? They're no. exercising there. <laughs> Good. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, is that a place? Spurl Gymnasium? I, I, Why would we know anything about that? <laughs> Why would you ask us that question? Just, just, I'm just making conversations. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a school, I believe. <laughs> um, I've, I've just Googled it, and unfortunately, the only things I can find are people saying, uh, Freud graduated from there, and then a page in German, which honestly... Too many long words. So he got a medical degree in 1881. He was working at the University of Vienna um, with, you know, um, uh, physiologists, like like leading physiologists, apparently, um, uh, Ernst von Brucke um, and also uh, Hermann von Helmholtz. Um, as I said, he got, his, got a medical degree in 1881 um, and he focused on neurobiology. So he was basically looking at brains, nervous tissues and stuff like in humans and animals. And then he was a clinical assistant in uh, general in Vienna General Hospital. Um, he trained with a psychiatrist, Theodore Maynard, um, and the the professor of internal medicine, Herman Nothnagel. I love that internal medicine because most medicine is internal. I think. Anyway, not uh, mine. It goes on my belly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you just got absolutely wrecked there, Corey. Where does it go from your belly? On the hair, on the skin. <laughs> <laughs> you apply it externally. Yeah and, yeah. and then where does it go? I mean, it's alcohol. It probably evaporates. <laughs> right. So <laughs> moving on. Um, uh, he got, uh, and uh, I love this quote. It said, <clears throat> at this time, he also developed an interest in the pharmaceutical benefits of cocaine, which he, per- <laughs> which he pursued for several years. This explains everything. <laughs> hey, we've all been there. Okay. I Nope. <laughs> no, we haven't. No, literally, none of us even have. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, uh, but to be fair, there back then, like cocaine was. I think it was used as a numbing agent for yeah. dental work specifically as well. Mm. So yeah, he was using cocaine for a number of things. Apparently, eye surgery, which was that was a big one. As in, he was taking it and then performing eye surgery. No, no, they were using it <laughs> in eye surgery. Apparently, his friend Carl Kohler was the, was the person that uh, was the person that figured that out. Yeah. 
Just sprinkle some cork in their, in their in, eyes. In the eyes. I got no problems now. Cataracts yeah. be gone. It's, it's, it's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but it says the general outcome was disastrous. <laughs> 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 uh, basically, um, he... <laughs> Freud was like, "Hey, this is really good. Like cocaine, I think it's it's the, it's the drug of the future, lads. It's 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 where you gotta be." And his friend uh, Ernst Fleischl uh, von Marx. So Jesus Christ, why are their names so long? Anyway, um, he uh had a mortal addiction apparently. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, mortal so addiction. He died from uh liking cocaine too much. We've all been there. <laughs> Can you have an immortal addiction? Yeah, most people have an immortal addiction. Well, sorry, not most people have not most people have an immortal addiction to cocaine, but most cocaine ag- addicts have an immortal addiction to cocaine. Well, that, no, that they that don't, is, no, no, it's true. not immortal. It's uh, on the science they, podcast. A non-mortal addiction to cocaine, <laughs> as in most people don't die of their cocaine so addiction. So vampires have absolutely mortal. Vampires have an immortal addiction to blood. There you go. Isn't it? Well, do we have an addiction to water? I mean, can you live without water? Yes, I do have a reliance, but I don't have a tolerance for it. I have a tolerance for this conversation. So <laughs> moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so his his friend died because uh, Freud was like, cocaine is awesome. And he killed his friend. I'd like no, no, no. Hold on, like, I'm gonna read a verbatim quote here. It says, "Whether or not one interprets this episode in terms that called into question Freud's prudence as a scientist, it was of a piece with his lifelong willingness to attempt bold solutions to relieve human suffering." Man, like n- you can't just you can't just play around with people like that, you know? Like I think cocaine is really good. Everyone should use cocaine. It can't take that much testing to be like. Mm, Maybe too much cocaine is is bad. Do you think it's a bold solution for human suffering when they started drilling people's skulls that actually, to release the demons? But uh, drilling someone's skull to release cranial pressure is actually useful. But yes, I suppose, but the demons not so much. I'd, maybe if the demons are causing the pressure, Noah. Are <laughs> you are you a, are, you a, are you a brain doctor? I just are you even thought... a demon doctor? How many shamans do you know? Name five. Oh, that's a lot of shamans. You know one shaman. Do I know a shaman? <laughs> yeah, we went a shaman that one time. Which one? On the tour bus. Oh yes, he yes he was he was also trying to find <laughs> solutions to human suffering <laughs> from Brazil specifically. I just sat and observed. It was very interesting. Were they bold? No, he was like a forty-year-old man who like went to Brazil once and was like, "Bro, I got this, I got this thing." And he was. Was it ayahuasca? It wasn't. No, oh, what no, was no, it? No. It was. It was. It was called rapé. It was like a um, tobacco oh, thing yeah. that he would shoot up people's noses. Yeah, yeah. But you wouldn't get high from it. You would just they they just kind of sit in pain for a little bit and feel really refreshed afterwards. Right. I, I I just sat and watched the entire thing, and he offered it to me, and I was like, I think I'm good. Yeah, we just I think we just come back on the bus from a stressful day, and we're just like, what, what's yeah, we're what's going when on? When in Philadelphia, deny a shaman. <laughs> Shoving tobacco up your nose. Yes. Yeah. So you know, Freud. If we're getting a picture of him, I. It seems that he's quite a headstrong fellow, shall we say? Yeah. 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 Well, he liked, as far as I remember from vague readings, he liked to assert things with no evidence whatsoever, and indeed downplayed the need for evidence. (laughs) Who needs evidence when I've spoken to some people and I have, I have some good ideas, huh? Got some, I've got some good thoughts up in this (laughs) noggin. I I bet you they're right. My friends think cocaine is great. (laughs) My friends love cocaine. I love cocaine. My friends love it. Who, like, who hates cocaine? No, so, goodness me. He left Vienna um, in late 1885 um, to continue studying neuropathology um, in Paris for a little bit. Um, He was there for, I think, I think he wasn't there for 19 weeks. Yeah. Um, And this is apparently like a big moment for him. So um, he was working with, um, he was working obviously with another sort of doctor, um, but uh, he he met patients that were uh, classified as hysterics. Who wants to give me the etymology of hysteria? It was to do with the womb, the histo, which is maybe Greek. And it was, they, they, they just suggested that women were going crazy because their womb was traveling all around their body. Yeah. The Egyptians believed that the womb caused problems in other areas of the body. It would Wand- it was like the wandering womb. It would go to like your brain and make your brain all stupid. Go to your heart, give you heart problems. You know, it's it's why women were so bloody unruly and annoying. Their that's wombs. why that's why women are bothering me because of their wombs. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so it is um, it is from the the Greek, I believe, the oh, ancient okay. Greek. Cool. No, the, the, yeah, the name hysteria is yeah. from well, Usteria, I believe, um, from the ancient Greek. Um, yeah, because you know, uh, whenever women do thing you don't like, because crazy. True. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll not talk of that any further. No. So um, he met uh, patients that were, um, you know, hysterics uh, was what they were called at the time. And so um, <laughs> this is what triggered him to think that, ah, maybe the problem isn't the brain. 
but the mind. Ah. ah. Which, you know, is an interesting thought to have because, you know, we talk about, we talk about this fairly often on the podcast, like the separation between the brain and the mind. Like, for all we know, the mind is just an illusion that the brain makes to, you know... <laughs> Pass the time, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> pass the time. But the time exists in the mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it makes the mind, uh, and then it... it makes time in the mind, and then it goes. I don't want this, so I make more mind to pass the time that I made. Well, look, the brain has got to do stuff, right? And so it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll make the mind you know, to make this easier, but also I'll make it think that like it's not in con- that it's in control when actually me, the underlying brain, is yes, actually in control. Very sneaky. Goodness me. Anyway, so he thought, you know. That um he thought that the issue might be with people's minds, not their brains. Do you mean in a as opposed to right as opposed to there being something structurally wrong with the brain? There's some there's like it's like the yeah, programming on the brain, the so you need psychotherapy. Software that versus hardware. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So instead of your computer having a faulty part, it's um that dodgy bloody virus you downloaded off of that that site. You watched too many videos. Yes, too many, too many, too many videos from the dark places on the interwebs. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm, yes. Don't watch them. It's very naughty. BBC iPlayers. <laughs> Without a TV license. Oh boy, that's dangerous. It's quite dark, man. No, so um, <laughs> he he kind of he kind of thought that. Um, and apparently, uh, the guy he was working with, his name was uh, Jean Martin uh, Charcot. Um, he found sort of a link between hysterical symptoms, um, like limb paralysis, and um, hypnotic suggest and hypnotic suggestion. What? So hysterics. So people that were like, I don't know, like had like. Mentally serious Ill. mental problems yeah. yeah and like you know you can have i guess psychosomatic limb paralysis okay. i assume you wouldn't I... stop punching them <laughs> right so uh, dead arm is that a yeah. good good job so um basically he he find a, he's kind of seeing a link between um hyp- hypnotic suggestion like hypnosis and um hysterics you know um and you know, he was like, "Oh, maybe it's maybe it's your mind making problems rather than nerves and and your brain and all that all that sort of stuff." And then um, Freud was thinking about that for a bit, and then he was like, mm, "Nah, don't, not a fan of hypnosis. I don't, I don't think. Nah, right. screw that." He, he tossed that away. Went back to Vienna in 1886, but um, had that like had that like, "Oh man, maybe it is the mind stuff. Maybe it is the mind and not the brain." He had that, you know, he had that cut about his head for yeah. a bit. So he started a clinical practice in neuropsychology. Um, I believe that was with uh, Joseph Breuer. That was after he got back from Paris, obviously. Um, and he stayed there for about 50 years. That that um, that uh, practice he opened up, that was his like, sort of consulting room, apparently, for like half a century. Um, and he was, he was, he kind of apparently was like, I'm a scientist more than I'm a doctor. You know, I'm a, I'm a science, I'm a science guy. Like us. Um, <laughs> um, and so, it, it, and that is kind of like, I think that makes a lot of sense with what you know from Freud, right? In that it doesn't seem like he treated his patients terribly well yeah. or with a lot of humanity or, you know, the way a doctor might if they want to help people. He would seem to be more of a kind of, let's get some crazies and see how they tick. Like huh? one big clinical trial. Yeah. yeah. Just, just prodding them, experimenting. Yeah. Anyone, anyone complains about his bedside manner, he's just like, oh, well, I'm a scientist, you see, not a doctor. I'm a scientist and you're crazy. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, so he was, um, he was, um, as I say, he was really influenced by uh, Breuer. Um, so apparently Breuer was the guy that was like, if you just get someone that's, I mean, again, hysterical patient and i don't even know what term to use here because like th- it's very broad right it's yeah. just people who are like i, I guess Mentally probably Ill. like some some kind of like schizophrenia like with a few of other sort of similar ish things in there ones that like you know the sort of mental illnesses that make you um and i'm putting this in the biggest quotes like sort of Delus- visibly crazy uh, i thought you were gonna say delusional well yeah but like i mean lots of people are delusional like for example luke thinks that haircut works for him i need help all right. I like your hair, Luke. Thank you, Noah. Well, you need help too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. This is my entire personality. It's stored in here. What, your That's hair? true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you ever see me true. bald? No. Yeah. It's very funny. You just cease to be. Yeah. Be he just cry. Man. Mm-hmm. He just. You know what? If you if he if you shaved his head, I promise he'd cry enough to fill an entire bath. How much do you think you could earn? Like, how much do you think you could raise for charity if you decided to shave your head? Oh, lots. I think people would actively. 
um, not want to donate to charity because they're too attached to his hair. Yes, people have told me that disappointed at haircuts I've received. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Leave him alone. So getting back to Freud, um, uh, well, actually Breuer. So Breuer was like, okay, my 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 crazy patient, just 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 chat, just keep talking. So the idea was you just get him to talk, um, and you know, not and not just talk about anything, but talk about you know the symptoms and when they started. Um, that would sometimes make the symptoms go away. Whoa. So this discovery, right, was that talking about problems makes you feel less bad about them and maybe can help you be less mentally ill. Wow, I don't agree. Matt, I know you don't agree. I don't agree. I think I think storing them up in your brain means that they could be a useful resource for the future. Mm. If you're a musician. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can mm -hmm. make content out of it, write a few songs. Is that why you always feel better after you talk about your problems? Uh, so usually I would say that that would be an anomaly on those several occasions that's happened. Ah, uh, yeah. And that makes that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you always feel really good about storing them all up in your head, right? Yeah, I have so many things to think about. <laughs> Cuz usually it's what just would completely life be blank without loads of trauma to think about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never gets boring in here. <laughs> you are the hardest nut for like some therapist to crack. I, I promise really not. you. I cried in my first therapy session. <laughs> So this is the invention of psychotherapy then, which is pretty amazing because Freud gets a lot of flack for his like dick theories, but that was a pretty big breakthrough. Yeah, no, it, it was. Yeah, but also it wasn't Freud. It was Breuer. Joseph oh, Breuer. Yeah. OK. Um, Sorry, they rhyme. Basically, they moved away from the sort of hypnosis stuff that uh, Charcot was doing. Um, and yeah, so Breuer was like, OK, uh, you know, like it was it's, a, it's a, apparently like more like auto hypnosis, which is like. I mean, all hypnosis, all hypnosis is self hypnosis, yeah. really. But um, essentially, it's just you just talk about like, oh, what was what was going on, like when, like you know, all of this sort of started when you when when these symptoms started, mm. what was the, what's the situation, what was that all like? Or even like on the most basic level, when you talk about, if you say something out loud that makes sense in your head, and then you actually say it out loud, you're like, that. Hang on a sec, I've been telling myself a lot of nonsense this yeah. whole time. I, I genuinely can't believe living in a time where. Like the leading brain, like head, mind doctors didn't realize that talking about, like verbalizing, you know, things like that was beneficial. Yeah, that almost feels a little bit like the when men discovered the clitoris and all the women went, yes. Um, in that, like, we had <laughs> men been, discovered the clitoris. As it's like science. <laughs> science, oh, yeah, proved the existence of. Oh, yeah. Science has proved the, the existence. Pleasure. Science has proved the existence of the clitoris in multiple animals multiple times, and they're always. Very surprised whenever they, like, we did we did a whole bonus episode on um, scientists finding the snake clitoris like you know a few, a few months ago the snitoris yes and it's like <laughs> it wasn't hard to find Where is it, it? Just, like, it, was, it was literally like one scientist looked for it and there snake. it was yeah I know it's on a snake where on a snake by the tail well near like, where the sneeze would be but the for snemails snemails. <laughs> If you like this little interaction, go and join our Patreon because you, you can get an hour of Snokes like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but God. it feels almost like the when when scientists quote unquote discovered the, the clitoris in that like, you know, people had been going to speak to, for example, the vicar or whoever at their church for quite a long time and mm. feeling better because of that and having conversations with, with, with their God and feeling better because of that. And then suddenly science comes along and goes... Hark! Eureka! Talking about your problems with another person makes you feel better about them. Yeah. Well, to be fair, that's interesting because we speak about this kind of... Um, we've sp spoken about this a few times about how, you know, science is just a way of looking at the world. And the, the episode that we did on witchcraft, I think, specifically was, uh, quite, was quite good for that. Wherein, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things in sort of Wicca and witchcraft, a lot of those sort of practices, which are, um, you know... I guess you could look at them from a, through a scientific lens and they make sense. So, you know, casting a spell, for example, that's one of my favorite examples, casting a spell or like, you know, manifesting something um, is just kind of thinking positively about it, right? Mm -hmm. And really thinking about it. And that just kind of primes you to notice that thing. So if you're like, okay, I'm going to cast a spell to make, to, to find money, you know, like a, a good luck money finding spell. You're looking and for it. Yeah, you're just a little bit more, like your, your subconscious is just a little bit more primed for that. And oh, there's a penny on the ground. Or the next time you find, you know, a five pound note on the ground or in your wallet or in, in, in a jacket or something, you're like, oh, wow, 
the spell worked. It's like almost confirmation bias, but a little bit of like optimism bias. It's, yeah. It, which, hey, if it works for you, it works. Like if you can be happy and not hurt anyone. Yeah. All good. Uh, uh, it's confirmation bias, but also it's like setting up your your brain is constantly filtering out information yeah. from the world all the time so if you have like instructed your subconscious mind to like look for money it might be statistically more likely to spot it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah no like it, there's there's so many different ways that this kind of kind of all works together yeah. and and you know that's the thing that's why um you know spirituality and non-organized religion are not really bad things in my mind or not necessarily antithetical or um in opposition to uh, sort of science. It's more like the story that is told about those things might be non-scientific, but the yeah. act in itself might have the desired outcome. Absolutely. But the like, idea that that's because a man in the sky, a noun in the sky went, aha, yes, you can have what you want. That might be the the not yeah. true bit. Th that's why I think organized religion is not great, right? I'm not a fan of like, here are rules and prescriptive things that you that you have to do. And this is like, this is the way to do it. And this is the, this is the wrong way. And this is like all of that sort of stuff. I'm not behind that. But spirituality, very cool. For me, by the way, like science is almost like that kind of thought process, that kind of stuff is akin to religion for me. I literally, I, I've tried. I just cannot believe in the God stuff. I, I can't. Yeah, I remember when I stopped believing I was five. And it was just after Christmas because every year I'd ask my parents, like, oh, can I get a Game Boy, please? And they say, no, 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 you're not getting a Game Boy. I was like, okay, well, so it seems like if I ask for something, I get it. And they pretend that I'm not going to get it. Mm. So I asked for a dog. I was like, can I have a golden retriever, mom, please, dad, please, can I have a golden retriever? And they're like, no, 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 you're not getting a dog. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to get a dog. So I prayed for it. And then I didn't get a dog. And I was like, wow, if God was real, I would have a dog right now. And then I just stopped. That is the most you story yep. I have ever heard. Yep. Oh, what shook your faith? Didn't get a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. I never could believe though. Like I realized at one point I was just like kind of like pretending because everyone else was doing it. And then at one point I was just like, well, I'm not like, it was always like, oh, well, just in case, you know, just mm. like this seems weird. I'm not, I'm not vibing with it. I don't know whether it's a neurodivergent thing, but whenever everyone was praying, I was just kind of sitting there being like. What are we doing, man? Like, I'm bored. Like, this is like, I can't vote. Like, sitting here for ages. It's just like, I was everyone quiet. I'm like looking around. I'm like, okay, like, it was, uh, it's like, it, it just, it always felt silly to me. And this is me thinking back to when I was like four or five years old. Like, <laughs> it was just, I just didn't, it didn't click with me. But, um, you know, moving past that, like, the idea of like a god as like a collective consciousness or like, you know, kind of, um, the, the, the kind of like, this like kind of metaphysical idea of everyone working together, all that sort of stuff, makes enough sense to me. That's fine. If you like feel like sort of some kind of spirituality or whatever, that's that's cool too. The thing that gets me, that, that, that excites me, that gets me sort of like, um, you know, going that like, the thing that really sort of sticks in my mind is just thinking about us being literally just a part of the universe, right? Not separate from it in any way, but just atoms that have consciousness. That's like really interesting to me. That's like a, a weirdly sort of spiritual thing for me, in my mentality, which is all just based in the science of like, we have no idea, how, we have no idea really how consciousness exactly works. Like we know that we're made of atoms and all of that stuff. And like, you know, uh, when it comes to like quantum mechanics, like the little that I understand from that, like it all seems really interesting. And that's like my <laughs> sub in for any kind of religion or spirituality, you know? Mm. ding -a -ling -ling, is that the ad bell? I think it is, but it's, it's rather quiet this time. Well, Luke, we want to keep a big old secret about this Psy Guys merch. Yes, please do not tell anybody and do not purchase any of it. Otherwise, people will find out. They might see you wearing our merch or displaying our merch and think, oh, wow, what a cool person. And I'll tell you this, as a cool person myself, having people think you're a cool person can be very, very stressful. Yeah, we can't have that. We also can't have you supporting the show to exist that you're enjoying right now. Yeah, so absolutely under no circumstances should you go to normalcitizen.store and pick up some Psy Guys merch. Some Psy Guys merch like beanies and posters and t-shirts and calendars and cool stuff like that definitely don't go to that store and buy that goodness me that's an awful lot of stuff that i'm not going to purchase absolutely luke now let's get back to the show before anyone listens to us God, i really hope we got away with that one so we've kind of got to the point where they've started to figure out that talking about your problems might be a good thing. I mean, they <laughs> called it the talking cure or chimney sweep sweeping, different names from different sort of people. Um, again, the idea is like, <laughs> people are like suppressing these emotions or there's all this sort of like pent up feeling or, you know, um, all of this sort of stuff that's then causing 
that kind of behavior, right? You know, like causing that sort of pathology. Um, so just talking about it can help like abate that or, you know, kind of um, deconstruct it almost. Mm. Um, and anyway, Freud continued on sort of trying to figure out his own stuff, like really like n like nail it down, hammer it in. And I mean, he had like a bunch of different theories. I mean, um, I mean, before we get to the theories, I just want to say this as well. Uh, but <laughs> Breuer ended up like st like stopping his relationship with Freud. He like he's like, I'm not, I cannot be friends with you anymore, mate. I cannot do this. And the reason that it says here is apparently because he thought that Freud was putting too much emphasis on the sexual origins of a patient's neuroses and was completely unwilling to consider other viewpoints. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be freaked out if my best friend was doing that. Dude loves cocaine and he's like, hey, hey, patient, why are you crazy and sad? Hmm? Oh, You're well, right. It's because died. you want to have no. sex with your mummy and you are envious of penis. My father was killed by you a like whale. You like penis? <laughs> <laughs> Little girl! <laughs> I just love the idea of this coked up, like, <laughs> like scientist masquerading as some kind of, like, uh, like doctor psychiatrist being like, everyone is sad and crazy because they love sex so much. Like, <laughs> and his friends being like, hey, so Freud, um, not everything's about sex. Freud's like, no, it is, and he's like, okay, like I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> so none of Freud's ancestors are watching this. <laughs> like you used to speak like this about my granddad. Their ancestors, descendants, ancestors, <laughs> <laughs> same thing. <laughs> okay, okay. You get the point. I'm just making clear for anyone that might not understand. Maybe, maybe they think this this show goes out to ghosts. It doesn't, because Luke is ghostophobic, and that's not. He's scared of them. It's like homophobia, but for ghosts. Yeah, I hate ghosts. <laughs> Of Freud's ancestors. <laughs> so we talk some about some of Freud's theories. Uh, what? What? Uh, do you know any Freudian theories? Just can you name any? Oh yeah. Well, Freudian uh, Oedipal theory. Oh yeah, the Oedipus complex. Oedipus complex. So what is the Oedipus complex? Anyone know anything about that? No one. I feel like you have some ideas. Is that the one about the little boy wanting to have sex with his mum? He is sexually attracted. Or is it the other way around, where the little girl is into her dad? Ah, no, yes. So that's the uh, no, penis no. envy. And yeah, no, no that's penis not penis envy. envy. No, that's penis envy, envy is wanting a penis. Ah. Oh, well, so I remember learning this in psychology, and I was like, yeah, maybe Freud was right. <laughs> As a little girl. And I was like, yeah, this penis envy thing. I mean, this makes me feel way more normal. <laughs> I like this guy. Um, yeah, Did so, you say that? <laughs> God, no, I was not out of school. <laughs> this actually does ab absolutely match up with you. Apparently, it's, um, it's, it's his idea of, like, uh, development, psychosexual development, wherein, um, like, girls, the like younger girls, um, feel anxious when they realize they don't have a penis. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was right. I'm sorry, but you're not like other girls. You're yeah. a boy. No, I know that. What I mean by, like, did you share that in school was, like, obviously you were, uh, like, a trans man and you were coming to terms with that. Yeah. But you, that wasn't, like, a totally normalized thing yet. No. And so were you, like... Did you turn to any of your girl friends and go like, hey, I feel this thing that Freud says that no. we're feeling? No, I remember specifically we were learning about the different. That was, this was younger. And like we were learning about sex um, when we were like 10. And there was this girl that was my friend. She's like, yeah, I've, I've like I've like tried it like with a with a pencil just to see what it feels like. And I thought she meant she tried having a penis with a pencil. Oh, I was like, yeah, me too. Oh. <laughs> But no, I did not tell my friends that I had penis envy. Okay, a pencil, really? You got stuff somewhere? Yeah, look. Well, I just mean it's like it's not the it's not the best girth to it. Anyway, um, but I wasn't worried about girth, <laughs> really, <laughs> at the age of ten. <laughs> It isn't so, fat enough. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no. So that that was penis envy. Um, no, the Oedipus complex is um, is is different. So um, Oedipus uh, obviously is the I think it's Greek, ancient Greek sort of um, mythology. Um, what is it? He ended up um, like having sex with his mother and then and killing, killing his himself. Father. Oh, killing his father. Yeah. yeah. What? But, like, he didn't want to. I think. And then crows Sorry, pecked out his eyes Freud. or something. Sorry. <laughs> What a plot twist! Freud just has sex with his mom and kills his dad. I was like, it would make sense. I mean, you've not much of a plot twist, yeah. No. Yeah. Kind of predictable, really. <laughs> so, um, between the age, between like three and five years old, 
Freud was like, yes, it's very normal um, that all children are attracted to the opposite sex parent. That's a normal thing to happen between the ages of three to five. Three. And when you start to compete, it's like, it, like he's so, like, penis, the competition comes into penis envy as well. Like, you start competing with uh, the parent of the same sex. So, like, if you're a little boy, you're like, oh, I love my mum. Oh, I want my mum. And oh, my God, my dad? No, she's mine. My mom is mine. Dad, you stay away. And in penis envy, which isn't the which isn't the opposite version of it, yeah. um, it, it it's not. It's a, it's a slightly different thing. But um, in penis envy, that's like the start of a pro- the process from seeing the mother as like a sort of um, caring figure um, to more sort of like you know having sort of a, a sort of more antagonistic relationship with the mother, basically competing um, with her um, for attention and then like really liking the father. Um, and apparently he said that penis envy could lead to um, resentment because, mummy, you didn't give me dick. And now I'm mad at you because it's your fault that I don't have one. Yeah. We've all been there. No, it's literally it's I mean, literally have... entirely on the dad. The dad is what oh, de- yeah. the dad determines the sex of the child. We've, we've all been blaming our mothers for that, is what I'm saying. <laughs> you should have had sex one second later. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love how much this is matching your specific experience. <laughs> um, also, on top of that, seeing the mother as being castrated, like, more like a eunuch. Well, oh, no, no, balls, more, more like, it? more like, as in, um, so there's the opposite of penis envy is castration anxiety, which is when like, yeah. like young boys realize that um, that girls like generally don't have penises. They're like, what? And then they're worried, like, what if I will will don't have a penis? That would be bad. I right? don't have any recollection of that kind of feeling ever. What? Literally not. Freud was wrong, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yes, obviously. Sorry, spoiler. No, it's, but yeah, obviously wrong. Um, also, um, like, this is really, this one is, <laughs> gi- like, giving up on phallic activity. Um, basically, uh, clitoral masturbation and adopting passivity, vaginal intercourse. That is a part of penis envy. Wait, apparently, so like, that apparently that's something that penis envy could lead to. Not rubbing one out. No, not rubbing one out. Popping one in. S- switching from rubbing one out to popping it in can cause penis envy. No, no, no. That's something that he thought would result from penis envy. Oh, so less pleasure, more. Well, like being passive. It's like, oh god. Well, I don't, I don't have a penis, so I, uh, I may as well just get it in the vag. Oh god. <laughs> Wow, Moving on. What a sentence. So no, guys out of context. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the opposite of the Oedipus complex was. Um, I had it. Let me, let me check because it's another, It's another like, I think, Greek uh, figure. Icarus, Theseus, Perseus. Oh, the Electra complex. That's that it. it. The Electra complex is the female equivalent of this. And obviously, um, you know, when we're talking about this, when we're saying men and women, we're, we're talking about cis men and women because this was like the 1800s yeah. or the early 1900s. Just for anyone who's listening and being like, ah, oh, but but some women do have penises. Yes, but I, I promise you, that was not on Freud's mind. That is not the point. I, silly transgenders. I really would have liked. I if if I could if I could you know take anyone from history, I feel like I would just like to bring Freud to now, and sit him in a room with you, for about as long as he could last, maybe about fifteen minutes. But I never wanted to have sex with my dad, so we'd that'd be that'd be a head to head with Freud. No, I know. Point. I just want to see what theories he comes up with after speaking to you for like fifteen minutes. Oh. You well, just he'd drive call that me man hysterical, insane. wouldn't he? Well, <laughs> I mean, he wouldn't be wrong, would he? Oh, 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 oh got him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the power to kick out a Sai guy? No, but I could just not cut to him. Oh. Just cut between me and you. So how's your name in, Luke? And I could fade his audio down. Let's just fade Corey's audio down here. Uh, there we go. All I right, will yeah. not be anyway, silent. So, yeah, I've had a pretty good day. Uh, yeah. How about you? I'm no, still here. All right, I've napped a few times. Notice you know, it's been me. way too hot. Uh, it's been really hot. Recently. Notice me. Yeah, it's pretty warm. We've been opening the uh, window whilst we've been recording the the episode. Look at no, me. no, oh, wait, no. Look at me. I'll unplug you if you don't stop. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's the last thing I said to my granddad. Oh, God, I just faded you in at the, <laughs> at the perfect time there. Fantastic. No, so uh, we've gone over the Oedipus <laughs> complex and we've done a little bit of penis envy. Noah's done a whole lot of penis envy. Yep. Um, why don't we talk about something else? This one is probably, the, I guess, the most popular um, today still is the id. Ego and the super ego. Yes. Ah. What do we know about that? What what are the what's the id ego and super ego? Uh, oh. I can't remember in in well the ego is as far as I understand the ego is like your concept of yourself, and I think the id is like the subconscious, 
Is that correct? So, yeah. I, they, they, like, ego is used in many different ways in many different frameworks. So I can't remember the Freudian one. Well, don't worry. I've got plenty of it, and I know all about ego. Well, oh, yeah, ego. Yeah, Great. Yeah, I was about good. to... Sorry, you beat me to the joke. Hey! <laughs> hey! <laughs> no, so there are the three parts of personality. You know, sort of like your concept of self in the mind, or who you are, right? Um, so id is the sort of impulsive, irrational... It's the unconscious stuff that... It's just like pleasure. I like it. Mm. Pain. I don't like it. And it's like it's like sex, aggression, like all of those like like very like um sort of like primal yeah. um oh, like things. This is yeah, so thing, yeah. me. This is so sensory. Um, <laughs> this is so put marbles in my mouth now. No, no marbles in the mouth. The ego is. Well, I mean, do you know? I mean, ego being like I. Right, yeah. like so, yeah. as in not I, as in um, I was gonna say Algen, like as in your but eyeball, you. but no, like I, as in like me, you know, yeah, yeah. Corey. um, Cory, me, Cory, that's what ego means. It means Cory, um, no, but that's the that's the part that like, do you know the part? Do you know the sort of like, I mean, not everyone has this, but do you know that like the the voice in your head that's like you? I don't you have, have any one voices. Of them. In, you have a voice in your head. Some people have like a voice in the head that's like them. It's like the you, the one that's like talking, the one that's looking at the world the and narrator. taking it in. The narrator, yeah. yeah. So it, it like it's it's the one that kind of like is making all the plans and like being being a people. Um and the superego is basically your conscience. It's like ooh ego, that's that's a morally dubious decision. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that. It's, it's boring. It's it gives you guilt and anxiety. <laughs> I guess this guy's real boring. Guilt and anxiety, you know, you've got plenty of superego. I do actually. You've got plenty of you've got plenty of id and superego and I'm gonna be honest, sometimes not enough ego. I'm I, I will turn to him and I'll be like, What are you thinking about? He's like, Nothing. And I'm like, you look deep in thought. He's like, literally not a single thing oh, yeah. is going I, on in I my mind. I do that all the time. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, I'm just floating around. Just, yeah. just vibing. Are you you blow your body. eyes as well, you just Oh yeah, just zone time. out. Wee Yeah. It's great. Yeah, we're we're yeah. You're on that side of the table. We're over here. I am constantly around. in thought. <laughs> oh, there's gosh. never silence. The only time there's silence is when it's so loud that it's just. That sounds so tiring. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm so tired all the time. No, I'm. Uh, that's why I'm so uppy all the. That's why I'm the way I am. I guess. Uh, anything else? Do you know any other Freudian theories? The Freudian slips. Yes, I know that one. <laughs> I don't actually have anything on the Freudian slip here. Oh, actually. so it's it's when you it's when you have a thought in your head and it accidentally comes out of your mouth without you trying to say it. Yeah, no, so I know you what I said the wrong thing. Good, no, I'm explaining to the viewers. Let you me be me, smart. You looked me in the eyes, and then you t- looked to the viewers to say that you're explaining. Hello, <laughs> you're looking at the wrong people. Is what I'm saying when you're talking. Hi, Luke. Hi. No. Uh, <laughs> no, you're you're right. I was saying like that is absolutely like the, what the the Freudian slip say, is. Yeah, no, you're superb. Good answer. Correct. I just don't know anything about <laughs> the Freudian slip. Um, okay, apparently um, it was in the psychopathology of everyday life. He described and analyzed slips like that. That he was he was talking about it. That's why it's called a Freudian slip, I guess. Freudian slip. You say something that you, you you're thinking without meaning to say it. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Good. Great. Shall we move on? Mm-hmm. Uh, what about um, gosh, dream analysis? You know anything about dream analysis? Did he invent the dream catcher? So he wrote the book, The Interpretation of Dreams. I believe it was Native Americans that invented dream catchers. Good unless on I'm being uh, culturally insensitive. Let me have a little check. Hmm. Dream catchers are. Native American. Hey, ding, ding, ding. You win the quick fire quiz. Woo! Yeah, no. So, um, in the interpretation of dreams, um, basically, uh, Freud was like, "I know why. I know why dreams exist. Do you know why dreams exist? Mm-hmm. It's because your mind is so it's having such a tough time, and dreams is the only way it can work through problems." I mean, that is sort of that's sort of somewhat what we that's think what about dreams, dreams are, yeah. now is that it's like the the mind is like it's almost like crunching over the information from the day, trying out theories, all that kind of stuff. Well, why did I have a dream that I murdered someone and had to drag them through a hotel and then a forest? What well, problem would you say that that was... Well, do you remember that time through? that you murdered someone and then dragged them through a hotel in the forest? You were probably feeling a little bit guilty about that. Uh. So, back to dreams. Yeah, uh, Freud thought that dreams were like a window into the subconscious, into the mind, which, you know, isn't necessarily untrue. We've done a whole episode on dreams. We've done a couple episodes on dreams, actually. One with the dream scientist... So go ahead and check that one out. Uh, it's linked somewhere. And if you're listening, mm-hmm. go to YouTube, please. I, 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 can't, I can't be putting things everywhere for you. I can't make it that easy. Was, so- the, was the dream scientist uh, Shark Boy? <laughs> dream, 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 dream. 
Well, I do you know understand what? that reference. He's just from Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what? <laughs> no I would idea. have laughed at that joke if you'd said Shark Boy's dad, who was the actual scientist within the dream world. Okay. I'm okay? Sorry. Was, yeah, if, you, silly of if me. you're going to invoke <laughs> the name of Shark Boy himself, you better do it with respect, okay? Because in this house, we respect Shark Boy and Lava Girl, like. In in inimitably, <laughs> oh, inimitably. Oh no 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 no! no. Oh, you're, not, you're not coming back from fantastic. that. Fantastic! You're not redoing that one. Inimitably. <laughs> no, so I mean, that's not actually too far off of what dreams kind of are. What we think dreams are. Obviously, we still don't understand dreams today at all. Mm. Um, well, not at all. But we don't understand them to, you know, a huge degree. And like, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what they are. You know, I mean, as you were saying, Luke, it's kind of you know going through going through stuff not necessarily problems or like you know um like real like deep issues it could just be like oh i'm gonna prepare myself for this potential scenario but you're you know obviously your brain's kind of like a bit funny and that's why dreams are really i'm so prepared for the eventual scenario of all my teeth falling out and crumbling to dust Really, I have had. Well, that's what's gonna happen as soon as, soon as you take the, as soon as you take those Invisalign out. That's what's gonna happen. They're just gonna crumble, Puff. crumble to bits. Oh my god! I, I swear to God, I had a dream the other day. I was in a, I was in an airport with my friend from home, and I could not find for the life of me my big suitcase. I had my, all my other bags, and then we had to rush to get to the plane. And I was like, oh no! And then I realized because this is what my brain does sometimes when I'm in a difficult situation in dream. I just break the reality of the dream just a little bit. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do magic. I'll just magic my suitcase to me. So I teleport my suitcase to me. But then my friend's gone. Where's he gone? And I'm like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just teleport to him. He's in the suitcase. No, I was getting, so basically, I was just getting really stressed out. And so I just found a loophole, like a, a shortcut. And then I teleported to him. And it was when I woke up, I was like, well, I was not in an airport if I could just just teleport anywhere I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> like, well, Very okay. good. So... Yeah, I mean, um, dream. In, like he kind of wanted to interpret dreams. Like the, the the main thing that I think is a bit of an issue is that he kind of uh, he kind of thought like, oh, if you analyze dreams and really like really like dig into them, and you know, you can understand them and figure out what the sub like what's going on in your subconscious. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you could maybe like think about your dreams and be like, oh, well, what is causing this? But also, like, I don't think there's just a uh, a flat like sort of like ah oh, this dream yes, means like, that no. that yes. dream means that like a glossary exactly it's yeah. like you're are you having stress dreams where you're stressed about things yeah you're probably stressed about something like yes there's symbology and stuff there but i feel like people are too unique and individual mm. like, they're unique individuals you can't you know just be like ah oh, yes this is this this dream means that uh but yeah no he was into dream interpretation we've spoken a little bit about his psychosexual theories um He's like, I mean, he he's really he was really phallocentric, by which I mean he was all about the dinks. So I mean, that's a lot about Freud. I mean, we could probably do an entire episode on specifically how he treated patients, or even you know any of his theories, because there are a lot of them. I mean, to give a kind of end point to this, I kind of want to talk a little bit about how basically everything he came up with was nonsense and how he mistreated patients and how he was a drug addict and how he was a sexist and also how I think one time he defended uh, uh, sex with minors. Look, all, all I'm saying Shock is... Shock horror. Yeah, look, like, wow, it's, it's really weird to me that he's become like the father of psychology. Like that's kind of the title that he's given when like, the man didn't really seem to care about evidence. He spoke. To, I mean, he like he spoke to people, um, and he wrote uh, uh, based on his experiences. But he was not a fan of like empirical evidence, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is Peer just reviewed studies. Dude, dude called himself a scientist. Didn't like care about empirical like uh, empirical evidence. Yeah. Like he did not. Out of interest, just off the top of my memory, what was his deal with Carl Jung? Was he taught by Carl Jung, or did he teach Carl Jung? Jung was taught by Freud. Yeah, but I think also Jung, a lot of his work was not based in like <laughs> science. Yeah, what well, this is? Look, okay, so there, there is, there is a benefit to you know talking about like experiences and bringing together that sort of like qualitative data. But when you're not, I guess, and like getting it in a sort of, um, I guess, standardized way, your 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 sort of results are harder to harder to really like root out and especially when it's it's much easier in that sense i guess for your own personal bias to like 
to come into it. And people are all individuals. I feel like uh, there, there's some truth in most models of psychology. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, except for like the very like <laughs> pseudoscience, like racist ones and all that. <laughs> but like there's some truth in, in a lot of them in that, you know, we are very complex. It's like personality tests, right? They're mostly nonsense, but some of them do ring true to some degree for some people in that, you know, there are some people that are more like this. There are some people that are a little bit more like that. But, you know, we did we did an episode on the MB, uh, the, the Myers-Briggs um, type indicator, which was, I think, based on Jungian psychology, which was based on not much. No, I'm... <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, there, there, there are some good things there, like thinking of the id, ego, and superego. It may not be, you know you know, absolutely, this is definitely how it works. But it is an interesting model to, you know, think about psychology or think about, you know, your sort of personality. Um, and it does it does ring true in some sense. Uh, psychology is, I think, a difficult branch of science because it's not as easy to, you know, find kind of cold, hard results. It's not as easy to do that, do it in psychology as it is maybe with other branches, particularly because, you know, as I said, we're all individuals. So, for example, half the people we know have ADHD, right? Yes. Yes. And all the ex YouTubers. <laughs> either neurodivergent or gay, or God forbid, both. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, um, not all people, you know, with ADHD present exactly the same. The same with autism. Like, I know a ton of autistic people, and they're all, yeah, there are similarities, but they're all very different. And not like, oh, they're different kinds of people. Yes, of course, they're different kinds of people. But the way that sort of um, their brain works, even though they're all, like, they've very much got autistic brains. They don't all work exactly the same way. It's it's. I feel like with psychology, there's so many variables and there's so much going on that it's very very difficult to pin down, uh, pin anything down or make a category that is you know distinct and discrete. Yeah. Right. Hmm. But yeah, no, that's it. Uh, that's all I've really got on Freud. Other than I've got a bunch of more stuff on his dream interpretation and his psychosexual theories. But I reckon I reckon we should save that for another episode. I guess my last sort of segment here, um, it's it it's just it, it's very quick. Um was he right? No, mostly not. But there were I mean <laughs> Oh, I have written here, nah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well like the super ego and id stuff, like I'm sure it's not like the final conclusion of how things work, but it probably helped other people that are interested in the study. Yeah, and to it's also yeah. figure out other well, stuff. Interestingly, the thing that I mention all the time that I am eventually going to do an episode on, mm. transactional analysis sounds roughly similar it sounds yeah. like a sort of developed version of the id super ego and ego thing um, because it splits you into child parent and adult adult being you parent being your critical uh self that holds you to account and child being playful messy artistic all those kind of things so it sounds somewhat similar and it probably came out of either um freud or young mm. like an off an offshoot from that yeah no i think what that highlights is that i mean all science but it's very easy to see with psychology all science isn't looking for objective truth necessarily i mean mm -hmm. it, to some extent it, it is but it, it's it's more about looking for useful models that are predictive yeah um and in psychology that's really the most important thing right it doesn't it doesn't matter like you can't ever prove that something's an objective fact because you can't you can't look at every single person but you can build a model that can help you figure out, okay, well, okay, I've got a model for this thing called ADHD, which means that this little gremlin is going to act like he's going to need to be given stuff to fiddle with during a recording session so he doesn't go absolutely insane. Yeah, there, there he goes. He's got his little fiddle toys that are very quiet. But that's the thing, right? Like, that model allows me to be predictive of people like Noah and others who have ADHD. Like, I know that people I know that have ADHD, I can't do certain things, or it's going to be difficult for them. Or, you know, there's, there, it, it's useful, right? Yeah. And that's the main thing. It's the same with, you know, physics. Physics isn't about, like, absolute, this is genuine absolute fact, because in some cases we can't, like, prove beyond... Like, you know, we've been wrong about so many things. Yeah, that's why, like, gravity's not real either, so, like... Well, yeah, no, you're... Yeah, <laughs> what a thing to drop at the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't drop anything, because gravity's not real, Luke. Um. Anyway, thank you very much for watching... <laughs>
<laughs> no, we've still got the quick fire quiz to go, don't we? Ah, dun 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 da. Freud edition. Do that again. Dun 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 da. Freud edition. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins. What do they win, Luke? They win um a penis. Oh, oh. there are stakes in this. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare. And Luke, what is your buzzer? Oh. And Noah, what is your buzzer? Ah. And my question for you is, what is the female counterpart to the Oedipus Complex? Ah. Noah, I think you got there first. Electric Complex. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. A penis uh, for me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, Noah, a penis for you. It's Luke's. Oh, Here are no. the scissors, Luke. All Get right. ready to chop. Oh, God. Okay. I don't want Luke's penis. Too late. Too late. Ah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the one, so, I don't want to get copyright striked, so like put it underneath the camera. There you go. Don't show it to the whole K. Just pop it in pop it in your trousers and we'll deal with it later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's all from us today. But before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and Glitch Rabbit. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the bot at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find the contact us at SciGuysBot on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and it's SciGuys on TikTok too! <gasps> or you can leave us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. You can follow me at NoFence everywhere, apart from Twitter, where it's NoFence Adams and TikTok, where it's the NoFence. Corey, stop rolling your eyes at me, I'm important. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>